but we were facing foreign problems on two fronts. There were ongoing disagreements with Mexico, for which I obtained from Congress their permission to use force. And at the same time that Ellen became ill, war had broken out in Europe. <sighs> Negro organizations were berating me for increased segregation in several federal departments, and for what they perceived was my turning my back after having reached out to them during the campaign. And I had a persistent physical problem with neuritis and a numbing in my right arm. And by November, the combination of my deep, deep grief and these presidential problems caused me to tell my confidant, Colonel House, that I could no longer think straight and that possibly I should just resign the presidency. But just as on that day in Asheville, North Carolina, so long ago, events occurred that could only have happened by great design. My young cousin, Helen Bones, was at the White House acting as hostess, but she became lonely away from her family and her friends. Dr. Grayson was concerned with the well-being of both Helen and me. He had a girlfriend named Altrude Gordon, who had been introduced to him by a mutual friend, a then 40-year-old widow named Edith Bowling Galt. As a favor to him, Grayson asked Edith to call upon Helen, hoping that they would strike up a friendship. I was born in 1872 and raised in Whitfield, Virginia, in the far western part of the state. In 1885, my sister married Alexander Galt of Washington, D.C., and 11 years later, I married his cousin, Norman Galt. But in 1908, Norman died, and I inherited his family's famous jewelry store, which had supplied numerous first ladies. I was not interested in politics, and I shocked my visiting sister-in-law, a huge Woodrow Wilson admirer, when I told her I would not accompany her to his inauguration. <laughs> I had seen William McKinley's and Theodore Roosevelt's inaugurations. They're all alike. Of course, I had viewed the White House many times, but I never thought that I, a tradesperson, would ever receive an invitation to the White House, much less become friends with anyone there. But Helen and I did become friends. And one afternoon in March of 1915, we were getting off the elevator to have tea. We ran into the President and Dr. Grayson, returning from a game of golf. We talked, and that afternoon, the Helen said that she saw the President laugh for the first time since his wife's death. I accepted further dinner invitations, and soon Woodrow was pursuing me with passionate abandonment. On May 4th, Woodrow told me that he loved me. You can't love me. You don't even know me. It's not even been a year since your wife died. Little girl, in this place, time is not measured by weeks, months, or years alone but by deep human experience. And since my wife's death, I've lived a lifetime of loneliness and heartbreak. I was afraid, knowing you, that this was going to upset you. But I would be less of a gentleman if I continued to take opportunity to see you without telling you that I want you to be my wife. Oh. But Edith would not respond. So in letters, I continued my pursuit a man is maimed and incomplete without his mate to whom he is lover and comrade. Here stands your friend in the midst of world affairs. Can you love him? Will you come to him without reserve and make his strength complete? I will serve you to the utmost and demand nothing in return. Well, I finally agreed to the marriage. <laughs> But after the election of 1916, so that our union would not harm Woodrow politically. However, we could not keep our courtship a secret any longer. When word reached his advisors and the public, some very nasty things began to happen. We became the butt of many bad jokes, like, What did Mrs. Galt do when the president asked her to marry him? And the ribald answer, She fell out of bed. <sighs> 
But the most serious assault was a plot by Woodrow's son-in-law, Secretary of the Treasury, William McAdoo, and Woodrow's advisors, Colonel House and Joseph Tumulty. They started a rumor that Mary Peck, Woodrow's old alleged flame, was furious that he was going to marry me. If he did, they said, she would make public all the letters that he had written to her. I did not want to embarrass Edith, so I sadly wrote her that we should not go through with the wedding. But instead of her agreeing with me, Edith said she didn't care, <laughs> and she wanted the ceremony to take place immediately. <laughs> so on December 18th, 1915, we were wed, the ceremony taking place at Edith's house. <laughs> Was I happy? Well, as that honeymoon train pulled out of the station, I danced down the aisle singing, Oh, you beautiful doll, you great big beautiful doll. <laughs>